Okay, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, this is now my third attempt due to some sound problems and I hope that this time we'll get some sound. Okay, uh, last time we finished by proving Fourier slice theorem and uh, I already noted that uh, this in a way solves, seems to solve our, all of our problems. It proves that, um, that uh, radon transform is invertible. So by measuring the radon transform of a function, we can recover the function. So radon transform is invertible in this sense. And uh, we even have an algorithm. Uh, so that, that seems great, right? I mean, so um, I'm, it seems like we're done. Um, I'll spend the first video by explaining to you why this is not the case and uh, why we still need something else and why we still need to do something. Um, throughout the lecture today, I will consider parallel scanning. That's what I introduced last time. So we will assume that we can measure the Fourier transform only for some directions theta k and uh, at distinct values sl. And this is the notation I introduced. Uh, we have, and we have p directions and 2q plus 1 locations where we measure. And also I will assume that uh, the conditions of Fourier slice are satisfied, which means that um, in this case, uh, I, um, I want f to be uh, supported in uh, the unit circle and uh, infinitely many times differentiable. And uh, you will see that my phantoms will not look like that, but uh, well, that's what it's like. Okay, um, so um, let's look at what we actually have to do and what, what we get after we take the measurements. Now uh, let's take theta k. So that's uh, theta of phi k fixed for one direction. Now, what we get from that is the Fourier transform on sigma times theta k. But uh, if uh, we don't measure the function, um, if we don't measure Rf um, disc, um, continually in continuously in uh, in S, then uh, we have only distinct values of SL. So we will only be able to compute distinct values of sigma l. So uh, we will compute, we will be able to compute the Fourier transform of f on points sigma l times theta k. And uh, if this is f hat on uh, R2, then uh, take this to be theta k, then we'll be able to uh, recover f hat on that line, but only on some distinct points, which I've marked with a green cross over here. And of course, if you go to a different uh, direction, then uh, you will uh, get a different direction, but the spacing of the sigma l's from the origin will be the same. Okay, so uh, you will, given real data, uh, you will only be able to recover the Fourier transform on these green spots, on these green crosses over here. That's only for two directions, of course, and you typically have about 1,000. So uh, that will be much, uh, much better. The covering of, uh, of the whole space will be much better. But you see, it's discrete. Finally, it's discrete. And the data is given not on a rectangular grid, but you see that the uh, green crosses are on a polar grid, uh, which will make things a little bit more complicated. OK, uh, first of all, let me note again, I already did that. If we have all the lines and uh, if we measure uh, for all s, then we can compute f hat everywhere, of course, because then uh, the whole um, whole plane of R2 is covered and uh, we can at least analytically return to our function. Now, if it's discretized, as I said, we can compute only for some theta k and some sigma l. So we get the data on these green crosses on a polar grid on R2. Now, um, what would we have to do to actually perform the inversion? Well, we have some g of theta k and sl. 
we take the Fourier transform along the second variable. So that's the analytic Fourier transform along the second variable. But uh, in the exercises today, you will show that uh, this can actually be performed, can actually be approximated using the uh, discrete Fourier transform. And if all the results, if all the sigma Ls, uh, sigma Ks, uh, sigma Ls, if the sigma Ls and the SL are all equispaced, then uh, it's possible to use fast Fourier transform. So um, that's very, that is very attractive because that's a very fast algorithm. So this can be computed very fast. Now we have all these g hat. And of course, what we can compute from that is f hat of sigma L times theta k. So uh, we get the Fourier transform f on that, um, uh, on that polar grid. And now we perform two-dimensional inverse Fourier transform um, to, oh, that's a plus over there. Now we perform inverse Fourier transform uh, and get our f, right? So, okay. Um, now, how do we actually do that? Uh, so we, this is an integral over R2. So um, that sounds pretty expensive to compute. Um, but of course, there's a simple way, a very simple way. And uh, we write that as the integral over R2, f hat of xi e to the minus plus i xi <laughs> d xi. And uh, now if we do that, uh, then we can write the integral over R2 as an integral over x1, x2, xi1, xi2. So that's an integral over R, xi1, integral over R, xi2. And uh, so writing it in this way and taking the this term over here out and the other term over here off, we see that the two-dimensional Fourier transform is nothing but a one-dimensional Fourier transform in one direction, that's in psi two direction, um, applied on a Fourier transform of the function in psi one direction. So it can be implemented as two Fourier transforms two one-dimensional Fourier transforms. And then again, I remind you of your exercise where you showed that uh, this can be executed. So that integration can be approximated using the fast Fourier transform. So again, doing this, this step over here, taking the inverse, uh, inverse two-dimensional Fourier transform is an extremely um, fast step. We have an extremely fast algorithm for that by doing the Fourier fast Fourier transform twice over here. Okay, so uh, that's great, uh, but we have a problem because um, the way you wrote it down in uh, uh, in your uh, in your exercises, you probably noticed that okay, for that to work, the data has to be uh, has to be equispaced. So to get this over here, we need the data on a regular grid, right? I mean, uh, if it's on a polar grid, then we won't be able to separate in Xi1 and Xi2. So we need the data on a regular grid uh, and we get it on a polar grid. So how can we do that? The first idea would be, well, we would, we could just inter, we could just do interpolation, like whatever, right? Um, nearest neighbor, whatever, linear, cubic. We have so many ways of interpolation, it sounds great. The problem is that f hat, uh, at least for uh, um, typical images, is highly oscillating. And interpolating a highly oscillating function is almost impossible. So um, there are some ways of doing that, and um, but, but they're really, again, they're very expensive and they're really quite complicated. So, um, that's more or less out of the question. If you try to do that, to interpolate onto a regular grid, then you will get massive, um, massive problems and um, you will get massive artifacts. Uh, if you want, you can try it. And it, it just doesn't work. The images are horrible. Okay, so uh, that doesn't work. So uh, next question, well, why don't we just do the integral over R2 as 
why don't we just take the integral over R prime as we would uh, usually do it? So, uh, so that's an integration of scattered data. So there are numerical and, uh, and there are numerical algorithms for doing integration on R two on with any data. So that works, but again, they are massively uh, expensive because uh, you have no way of reducing the effort like with a fast Fourier transform. So that's again out of the question. Uh, you would wait hours for one minute uh, for one um, picture to uh, to uh, come up. So uh, the patient might be dead before you're done. So uh, that's out of the question again. And uh, let me mention one thing that uh, I will probably not go into detail or only at the very end of the lecture. There's the non-equidistant Fourier transform, which can actually handle Fourier transform, no, fast Fourier transform, excuse me, non-equidistant fast Fourier transform, uh, which can handle non-equispaced data. And um, so that would be applicable here. It's in one dimension only, but that's no problem. Uh, and uh, it turns out that this really works. So you get a fast algorithm using that. Um, the application to Fourier uh, to the radon transform has actually been developed here in Münster, and um, but nobody uses it um, for some reasons. Um, like the, the the image quality is still not as good as we can reach it with other uh, uh, with other algorithms. So. All in all, implementing Fourier slice is very, very difficult, at least. Uh, and usually the images you get out are not perfect uh, due to the problems that I mentioned, or it, it just takes hours and it's very, very expensive to implement. Um, it was mentioned several times that uh, Hounsfield, who was an engineer and who um, engineered the first uh, computer uh, CT device. Uh, he was an engineer, not a mathematician. And many people say that uh, this was actually, he was actually very lucky because if he had been a mathematician, he would have realized uh, that uh, Radon had solved his problem of recovering images from the Radon data. And uh, he would have liked to he would have tried to implement that, and um, he wouldn't have been able to be, um, simply because um, he either I mean, the, Im the images would just have been bad. So um, he was very lucky that he was an engineer, and engineers are very uh, familiar with special functions. So he developed an inversion algorithm of his own using special functions which I cannot provide here because it really <laughs> it, it really needs a, um, a deep knowledge in that field, which I don't have. So um, let's, let me just add that he did something else. And um, but this is no longer uh, no, <laughs> this is no longer in use, luckily, to uh, today. So um, this is just a side note. Also, let me make uh, another side note. Uh, there's the Röntgen Museum in Lennep, which isn't too far from here. And uh, in fact, uh, usually I take the inverse problems course there just to uh, look at some of the devices they have there. They have uh, very modern computer CT devices there. And they even have, uh, I think, a model of the original first computer CT device that was built by Hounsfield, which he got the Nobel Prize for, by the way. And um, yeah, that's um, unfortunately due to the situation. Now we can um, neither go to the hospital in Münster nor to the Röntgen Museum. But um, if you ever have the chance of going there, I think it's very nice. I like it. Very, I enjoy it very much. And uh, you can look at some of the devices there. OK, um, all this is readily implemented. And um, I will now focus on a very special case. And um, let's for a second assume that only one direction is available. Now that's not doesn't make too much too much sense, right? We have only one projection, uh, and the question is, what does this algorithm do in that case? 
Okay, let's assume that the direction is theta equals zero, phi equals zero, so theta of phi is zero, it's a horizontal line. And uh, we measure along theta perp, so uh, that we are measuring along vertical lines. Okay, what kind of data can we recover from that? Well, we can recover the Fourier transform on that line theta equals zero. Okay. Now, um, how can we represent that? So we, um, let's just take zero, uh, let's, let's just take f hat to zero everywhere else because we don't know it. Uh, then uh, we can write the data that we have as uh, f hat of uh, xi1 and xi2. Well, for xi2 equals zero, this should be g hat of xi1. And uh, for uh, psi 2 not equal to zero, then this should be zero. So it's the delta distribution, which I already introduced. And that's in the sense that I've used many times now in a distributional sense. And we have that factor of square root of 2 pi. And from the fact that it's in the end, you can see that I already forgot it. OK, now. Uh, we take the inverse Fourier transform of that. So f of x1 and x2 is integral over 2 pi, but square root of 2 pi we already have. So 1 over square root of 2 pi integral. And that's uh, now the discrete. In, I'm writing the integral in xi1 and xi2. And uh, well, we have here the delta of xi2. So you see here the inverse Fourier transform of delta. We already proved that this is one. So uh, we can, re uh, the integral over xi2 delta uh, e to the i xi, x2 xi2 d xi2 uh, is, is one constant. And uh, here we have the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of g. So uh, this is 1 over square root of 2 pi, g of x1. OK, so uh, if we have only the data for one single line, then what we get is uh, a function that depends only on x1. So this is constant uh, along x2. Right? I mean, if uh, so it's, it's uh, um, x1 and dot is constant. So it's constant along theta perp. OK, um, that means that all changes along theta perp are lost, by the way, right? And so we are, we are losing all changes along theta perp. We, are only, we can only see changes that occur in direction x1. Now, how can we uh, explain that? Does that make uh, any sense? And I say it does. The simple explanation is um, take the measurement or take the experiment that we had. So as, assume that we have the um, we have this ellipse over here. We're taking the rayon transform of that, and we have theta equals to zero. So we're measuring along theta perp, so along vertical lines. Now assume that you want to find the value at some x over here, but all you have is the radon transform of the ellipse in this direction. So it's something like this, right? So I mean, the simplest thing that you can do at this point is, well, if I take uh, the value, uh, um, the um, I have only one line that crosses this x over here. And uh, we, we've measured along this line here. So the easiest thing that I could do is, well, I just assign to this point here the value of the measured, uh, of the, um, um, I assign to this point the value on the line, on the measured line that went through this point. Right? So what would I do? I would take this point over here. I would project it down and I would take the value over here and I would say, uh, I would um, assign that value to this um, to this image point over here and of course that would be the same for all the points on this line okay so um, then uh, what comes out is exactly what I did up here so uh, if I want to find the value at some point, let's take a different point over here. I search for the line that was measured and uh, that went through this point. 
and I will assign to this uh, to this um, to, to the image at this point just the value of the um, that was measured along that line. Okay, uh, so that sounds kind of reasonable, and uh, I will show you some examples. Um, now we might have an extension of that. Um, this was for only one um, for only one measured direction, and uh, it seems pretty reasonable. Okay, so uh, when we have multiple lines, why don't we do that for all the lines that we have measured? So uh, when we have many lines, what we could do, uh, so if we have many directions that were measured, um, then I look for all the lines where the, uh, that uh, were measured and which went through this point over here, and I add them all up. And that seems to make sense, right? I mean, um, only the lines that went through this point gave me some information about the value at this point. So just taking the average of that um, looks absolutely reasonable. Okay, and uh, it turns out that uh, this is a known algorithm, a well-known algorithm, and um, it's called back projection for obvious reasons. I mean, we are taking the values we measure over here and just back project uh, and project them onto this line. So sounds uh, sounds um, sounds okay. It seems to solve our problem because it's easily implemented, and there seems to be no there seem to be no numerical problems with that. So, um, if you didn't understand it up to this point, I will now show you the implementation, and I hope that uh, everything's going to be much more clear about that. 